what I'm going to talk about are the findings from a range of surveys to experience the uh, to explore the experience of Dundee citizens during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. So, so Angie's going to share my slides for me and I'll let you know, Angie, when I need to go on to the next one. Um, so this is to talk about um, the surveys, as I say, and, and in Dundee, uh, we has had a rapid and creative response to lockdown, as I'm, I'm sure happened in areas all across Scotland. Um, in Dundee, that included the council developing a helpline, special provision for the shielded groups and many services moving online really quickly. However, locally, staff on the ground felt that there was um, a need to gather intelligence regarding the lived experience of the pandemic for the more vulnerable and the need for evidence to back this up. We became aware of three pieces of engagement work um, and began to become involved in coordinating these so that we could synth synthesise the findings and build up a body of evidence, particularly in relation to giving a voice to those who were struggling most and finding, finding it hardest to be heard. Next slide, please, Angie. So as early as June last year, the Food um, Insecurity Network developed a survey aimed at people who had used emergency food provision during lockdown. Um, there were paper forms, uh, questionnaires left in food parcels or available at community larders, and there was 192 returns from 19 of the 24 emergency food projects in Dundee, asking a range of uh, categorical and free text responses. The graph at the bottom shows that there was um, some areas that had more returns than others, but there were returns across the whole city. And then in July, uh, Dundee Fairness Commission Fighting for Fairness launched a survey um, focusing on the more vulnerable people um, in the context of its three key priority areas of disability, mental health and fuel poverty. Again, there was an online survey and paper copies for the most, more vulnerable. It was mostly free, free text answers to that questionnaire. So that's your graph on the top left there, so showing that again there was a spread across the city. Engaged Dundee in August was for the general population to explore experience of using services as well as general experience of the pandemic. They aimed to gather information that would be useful in refreshing local community plans throughout the course of this year. Responses were mostly online with some paper copies and there was a mix of categorical and free text responses. This is a piece of research I'll, I'll concentrate on presenting today and again a range of um, responses from across the city. So the combined, so although it was different questions asked, there were crossovers between the survey and that gives us a, a combined sample of over 1500 people and at this point I'll say thanks to colleagues in public health and the council's research and information team for helping us to develop the surveys and most importantly, to analyse the data. It was particularly challenging where there was so much narrative and so many stories being told, but we're really confident that with their expertise, we've managed to get a good sense of what people were, were, were telling us. Next slide, please, Angie. Um, so this is where I'll concentrate mostly on. It's the Engaged on D um, survey, as I say, 192 responses. Next slide, please. Um, and this survey in particular, and in comparison to the other two surveys, gathered lots of demographic information. And so we know a lot about the characteristics of the people who answered the question. Um, almost three quarters were female. The majority of respondents were working age. Almost one fifth lived alone and more than half were in some form of employment. Over a quarter of respondents were in receipt of benefits and 45% had a long-term condition. Asking so much demographic information also allowed us to do some sub-analysis uh, sub um, to draw out some inequalities and I'll, I'll cover those later on in the presentation. Next slide. So the survey assessed use and experience of services during lockdown. Um, so the slide on the left shows numbers using each service and the slide uh, on the right shows 
was the proportion of these who were satisfied with that experience. And what this, what this information is telling us that the most commonly used uh, services over lockdown were GPs, websites, online resources, advice and support for physical and mental health and money, inv money advice. There were generally high levels of satisfaction expressed for the use of services, with the highest being for websites, food parcels and GPs. The lowest was around substance use services, where satisfaction was much lower than other services, but the number of respondents using these services was, was very small. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. The survey explored whether people were experiencing particular difficulties during lockdown. Um, and this graph shows numbers. Um, if we translate that into percentages, we can see that most people were um, highest and most common response was around challenges around mental health. And 37% of the total sample reported having difficulties. Um, this included social isolation for those who lived alone, and people who were struggling whilst working from home, and challenges around homeschooling and juggling that with, with work commitments and a range of other issues affecting mental health as well, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later on. Uh, the next most common was um, healthy lifestyle and 31% struggled to maintain or achieve a healthy lifestyle due to issues like not being able to attend usual fitness or health classes or being indoors due to shielding, um, things like increasing consumption of takeaways, etc. So those were the sort of explanations that people gave us. 20% felt that income and money were, was causing them difficulties. And the reasons reflect some of the stuff that Karen spoke about in her presentation, um, loss of income, to furlough or redundancy, job insecurity and fear of redundancy in the future and that notion of people really being uncertain about what their life circumstances were going to be like moving uh, out of this pandemic was, was, was really clear. If we move on to the next slide. Um, what I'm going to do here is, is just give an example of some of the inequalities analysis that we did. Um, we looked at sub-analysis for every question in the survey, so we were able to draw out um, who was um, doing better or worse than, than, than others. And I'll just use this mental health question as an example. All the sub-analysis are, are included in the full report. Um, so this, I guess, shows you where um, averages can be a bit misleading. So if you remember, 37% of the, the total sample on average um, reported difficulties with mental health during lockdown and the pandemic. If we look at particular age groups, we can show that there are stark differences related to how old you were with those struggling most in the younger age groups and, and quite a, a good linear relationship that shows that people struggled less with their mental health the older that they get older that they got. Move on to the next slide. Um, so if we look at a, a sub-analysis of people experiencing different difficulties with mental health based on their employment status, um, we can see now the, I think the average, um, sorry, I'm just checking. Average is 37%, but if we look at the likes of long-term sick and disabled, we're, we're not, far off double that in the terms of the proportion of respondents who reported difficulties. Um, also experiencing higher than av average difficulties were carers, students and the unemployed, whereas other um, uh, subgroups of people such as the, the, the retired were actually quite doing better than average in, in terms of their mental health. If we go into the next slide, we also sub-analysed in terms of the receipt of benefits. So again, bearing in mind that 37% was the proportion for the total sample, we have nearly half of those in receipt of benefits reporting uh, mental health challenges. Quite a big difference between those not in receipt of benefits. So you'll be getting a sense here that um, you know some people were doing much better, much much worse than, than others. If we go into the next slide, um, 
This again is looking at a, a sub-analysis based on whether people lived alone or with others. And again, about half of those who lived alone um, were, were experiencing challenges. And we know that, that that's connected to social isolation. Um, you know, as, so again, that, that gives us a good idea, I think, about where to target our efforts as well moving forward. Just to highlight, in terms of the other category there, um, we think that this includes what people were saying in the narrative, um, it tended to include those with insecure housing arrangements, maybe flat sharing or sofa surfing, and also those in student accommodation. It might include people in, in other kinds of um, temporary accommodation as well. So the next slide. Uh, so we asked a particular question about mental health to do a deeper dive into how this was manifesting itself in terms of symptoms situation so this included fear isolation bereavement and so on whether people felt that their mental health problems had gotten worse or they had developed mental health problems and this slide this slide which shows numbers uh, shows that we can see that sometimes the majority of respondents were experiencing these symptoms um, and very often they were experiencing a combination of symptoms so, for example, of the 553 people who reported experiencing fear, anxiety and stress, 411 were also experiencing low mood and depression, and 2,269 were experiencing social isolation and loneliness. We have breakdowns of this question, which I don't have time to go into, but for each of these sort of symptoms, for want of a better word, we can uh, draw out which types of people were, were more likely to be experiencing those types of problems. And I just want to, next slide please, Angie, I just wanted to um, put up some quotations to, to, you know, to, to illustrate the kinds of things that people were were saying to us and across all surveys there was so much narrative people were really generous and and sharing what they were experiencing and their, their thoughts and their feelings and um, we've been able to theme many of those to, to show the kinds of things that um, we want to take into consideration um, when we're trying to support communities and, and services to move forward. Next slide um, looks at uh, positive development. So we also wanted to explore where people might have actually found that things had improved for them in different ways during lockdown. Um, and this gives proportions that you can see that over half of people felt that there was you know, less traffic on the road, which is positive. They had more time with family, they made more use of green space and so on. Um, I'll give an example um, in terms of um, green space around uh, the sub-analysis that we did to see if those benefits were experienced equally or not. So if we move on to the next slide, if we look at that in terms of employment status, we can see that some subgroups of people um, were experiencing much higher than average respondents reporting benefits. So 30% of the total sample um, made more of use of green space um, retired people were higher than average. Actually, those employed full time were higher than average again, which might reflect folk having a bit more freedom through working from home arrangements. But worryingly, if we look at long term sick and disabled, we had only 10% of people who felt that they were able to make more use of green space. This might overlap with people who were shielding, perhaps. Um, again, we can't kind of can assume that, that everybody. Uh, benefited equally in terms of different indicators. If you move on to the next slide, which looks at community spirit, it was just over a quarter of the total sample felt that, um, that there was better community spirit over lockdown. Again, not experienced equally. Older population groups tended, certainly 75 plus years. Um, you know, we had 60% of people even that you know they they could see better community spirit and that might have been because they were um, recipients of voluntary activity or or what have you. So that's just giving you a flavour of the engaged Dundee analysis. If we move on to the next slide, I'm just going to really really quickly highlight a, a couple of things from the Fairness Commission and uh, Food and Security Network, Network surveys. 
So the next slide um, just looks at some headlines in, in the context of their three priority areas. Um, so in relation to disability, of those who reported a disability, two thirds felt that lockdown had affected their ability to access vital support services. Maybe unsurprisingly, a lot of services and, and, and health services in, in, in particular were suspended. And there's a real narrative that's quite um, humbling when you read it in this, this report, what that actually meant for people in practice. Um, in terms of mental health, this was the kind of highest proportion we found in terms of reporting mental health difficulties of any sample across the three surveys. So nearly, you know, almost 90% said that their mental health had been affected or, or that of someone that they knew. Um, and in relation to fuel poverty, almost three quarters of those with both types of meters, so that was a card meter or um, a direct debit dry meter, had, had found that they were using more energy during lockdown what came out through the research was that actually those with a paves you go winter were much more concerned about the cost of fuel uh, moving into winter. And also it's worth mentioning that although these were three different topic areas, we were able to do some analysis that showed that, um, for example, people with a disability, many of them were also concerned about their mental health and were also concerned about, about fuel poverty. Again, we have the report, if anybody wants to see that, it's, it's really worth reading. The next slide, just looking at the, uh, this was carried out in June and, and a report produced in, in September. If we move on to the next slide. Um, what's interesting about this was that if we aggregate financial issues across a range of questions, as a reason, reason for using food provision, then over 60% of beneficiaries were in some form of financial difficulty and, and four in every 10 were experiencing long-term difficulties rather than uh, only ha having to use emergency food provision because of the COVID situation. Um, I think that came out in Karen's research as well that this wasn't a new issue for some people. Um, many respondents felt they would need this kind of support long-term um, so it flags up the uncertainty people were experiencing and that emergency food provision is not only required during the pandemic. What also came out um, from this research that it wasn't just food provision people were getting at, at community larders, staff, CLD and other staff, community nurses were making themselves present um, to, from a safe, safe distance to support people and, and to signpost them to other sources of support. Um, and uh, the volunteers who were delivering food parcels were very much a source of social contact for people and a friendly face. And that was really seen as being incredibly valuable and beneficial for people during that period. So the last slide, Julie, what we've tried to do is across all the surveys to, to draw out key themes. Um, and what came out um, clearly was that, um, that for some people, this wasn't just a new situation that people were um, and, and, you know, struggling before the pandemic and it, it made a bad situation worse. So it's, it's worth bearing that in mind. And other people who have maybe hadn't been struggling newly found themselves in poverty in a, in a situation that they had little resilience or experience to deal with. So the key themes were around difficulties in accessing services. Online was working for some, not for others. And that's worth in mind as we, we move into the recovery period, um, especially if we're going to be maintaining a lot of online services. Um, there were day-to-day -day challenges of being locked down, including homeschooling and homework, and that was really impacting on people's mental health. Um, a lot of uncertainty and concerns about the ongoing nature of the pandemic, and people were very concerned. Some people were very concerned about adherence to safety guidelines and um, whether another lockdown would come, and actually it did come, and we knew that people were really worried about that. Um, mental health more broadly, so you know, people were um, you know, were, were stressed and anxious, um, and this was, Dara have told us that this was, for, for most people, directly related to what was going on in their, their lives. So that, that interconnectedness between sort of root causes 
and mental health and wellbeing and the point that Margaret made about, you know, we need to do both. We need to support people to, to improve their mental health health but that's directly connected to, to, to the life circumstances and we can't ignore that either. Um, social isolation was a huge issue, um, it would be re really difficult to address that because we couldn't bring people together. And what was clear from the narrative that it wasn't just around being separated from family and friends, it was around the withdrawal of the network of groups and activities that people relied on during the usual times. And lastly, and importantly, the financial and job insecurity, um, you know, people's lives were, were changing because of this, um, and that was causing an incredible concern. Um, I'll, I'll close there, but we've done a lot of work in sharing these findings across the system and at a range of partnerships, and, and CLD directly is looking at what it can do to support people in communities and, and I know that Nikki is going to talk about um, the next phase of Engaged Dundee in particular so I'll just stop there. Thanks for that Sheila that was uh, really useful and I think people can get a, a sense there of how in depth some of that um, information and engagement was and we've got a really good picture of what uh, lockdown was like for a good number of people in Dundee but as you said, um, there's no point doing engagement if you don't then go and take on uh, the results of that and embed that in what it is that you're going to do going forward. So what we'd asked the community learning and development team in Dundee to do was to look at what our short term and long term responses were to the results of the Engage Dundee work. So as everybody is, we're extremely limited in what we can kind of do uh, with communities and in communities at the moment, but hopefully that's looking positive over the coming the next few weeks. So a lot of that was really responding to some of the things that people had said that was really kind of high level stuff like low income and um, lack of access to household essentials and um, that kind of thing. So um, a lot of the work has been immediate work has been done is around about supporting community responses to that. So that's been doing things like setting up food larders where people can come and get um, food uh, as well as kind of energy and other kind of household essentials. Now, I don't think anybody as CLD workers wants us to be supporting food larders as our kind of day to day job. But what we do know is at the moment in communities, there is absolutely a need for it. And the other thing we know is when communities are actually able to generate those responses themselves, there's a lot more dignity, community cohesion, opportunities for volunteering, community spirit born out of that than if you bring in a, perhaps an outside agency to do some of that work. So a lot of the work that CLD workers have been doing to support these local community responses are around about supporting local people to access funding for some of the food, uh, to access funding for additional safety measures, uh, supporting them to work through risk assessments in order that they can run the um, provision safely and also volunteer management, that would be volunteer recruitment, induction, programming, all the things that you need to do to support that. As well as that, um, other areas of CLD such as youth work now, as I'm sure you do across the country, have a full um, online programme every single week, every, sorry, every single night of the week with activities every week, which is again is picking up some of the responses there about social isolation, poor mental well-being, especially for young people who um, came out of the Engaged Dundee process, that young people were particularly worried about their future and their mental health and mental well-being. So that's been some of the response now. In terms of the kind of medium term work, what we've said to uh, CLD colleagues is to go and start working with the local management groups in Dundee. So for those of you who don't know, we've got seven community centres in Dundee and each one of them has a local management group, which is an independent charity made up of local trustees who develop a programme for that community centre based upon whatever the local needs are. So we're now doing some work with those LMGs, uh, sharing the information from the Engage Dundee um, findings and saying, you know, it is about mental health, it is about social isolation, it is about perhaps people with additional support needs needing uh, more things to do in their local communities to kind of keep them all connected. So that's the bit of work that we're doing just now. The other place that we've taken it back is to our local community planning partnerships. So again, for those of you who don't know, each of the eight multi-member wards in Dundee has a local community planning partnership, which is made up of 
council officers, fire police, third sector reps, but is also made up of community reps as well. And I would say each of those local community planning partnerships has uh, at least 50% local community membership on them. And again, what we're saying to them is take the findings from Engaged Dundee and actually come up with some ideas about what you're going to do for local community responses in your very local areas to kind of respond to some of this, as well as what's happening perhaps more widely. So what we're doing longer term and is happening a bit more light, widely is in uh, 20, 20, early 2022, we need to develop new local community plans in Dundee. So these are the local outcome improvement plans referenced in the Community Empowerment Act. So our next phase of them is early 2022. So what we're looking to do is start to engage with local communities and service providers on um, working up those plans uh, right now. We're going to start doing that in May. And we've used the findings of Engage Dundee to um, influence the sort of questions we're going to ask and what we're going to do there. So what we would usually do, and what we did in our last one, is we used the Place Standard tool. And the Place Standard is a fantastic tool for speaking to people and getting them to think about what's going on in their local community. But as the name suggests, it's a little bit placey. So what we've done is we've used Engage Dundee to kind of put our own spin on place standard where we are asking questions about people's local environments, their local communities, their green spaces. But we're also saying to people, do you know, is there a good community spirit here? Do you feel connected to other people? Uh, do you feel like you've got power, voice, influence? Uh, do you feel like you've got access to services about food and energy advice, about mental health advice? And so we're trying to take what we've already heard from Engage Dundee, check that out with a broad range of people across Dundee, see if that feels right for them, see if they agree with that, asking them what would make life better for them around about that. And what we'll get is a probably a huge amount of information for each of the eight wards. And then phase two from that would then be to actually go and work with uh, local stakeholders uh, in order to actually develop those local community plan actions so that we're kind of taking that from the first question we asked Engage Dundee back in, I think it was August last year, August 2020, right the way through to the new local community plans, what we were being told by those people is filtering its way through into what we're doing strategically across the city. And it's not just about the information that people told us, we're also wanting to bring the people who told us that on the journey with us as well. So we're going to have far more opportunities for people with lived experience of some of the issues that are coming up through Engage Dundee to be involved in the local community plan development and the local community plan actions going forward. So what we might have done in the past is um, asked people what they thought about life in the city and then got the service providers and said, here's what people think, help us come up with the local community plan actions. I think what the Community Empowerment Act does and the kind of different themes within that is gives us far more uh, of an opportunity to actually get communities themselves to take forward some of these actions and as we all know that's far more powerful far more effective than getting uh, just services to do it so as well as the community reps that we have around about the various community councils local management groups within the city we're also looking for people with lived experience maybe a drug and alcohol project uh, drug and alcohol services lived experience of poor mental health, or it could just be lived experience of living in an area with poverty, because you know what that community is, and getting them far more involved using tools like participation requests, like community asset transfer, like participatory budgeting, uh, to actually take forward some of the things that are coming out of that. So that's the plan over the next few months. Uh, and as I said, what we really hope to get out of this is new local community plans that are really reflecting what people have told us and that have communities at the front and centre and their actual shape and delivery of what happens as well. So that's us, thank you very much. Uh, thanks Sheila, thanks um, Nikki for that, for that in, in, input. Um, I guess from um, the work that you were talking about Sheila, again as, was, uh, as, as you were going through that I was able, I thought the data that you were putting up was really powerful and I was trying to relate the data back to what we already heard um, this morning and the slide that you put up around about um, the breakdown, I think it was especially the breakdown of mental health and the age group things. I mean, I looked at that and thought back to the statements that Professor Ledworth had made around about that generation or those generations that were in place around before neoliberalism that shaped the, the values around about community and compassion and caring and kindness. It was evident that they were more resilient during the COVID 
period in terms of that mental health than those um, generations that have been brought up in a, in a context of um, humanism and, and, and neoliberalism um, approaches. And I think from your input, um, Nick, what I've taken from that is it's really heartening to hear how research that we're doing in the field is then being used to drive forward our practice. And I was particularly taken by your um, overview of the play standards approach that you're using in Dundee and how you've adapted those headings to be able to engage um, communities um, more positively around about what the research is showing. And I wondered if that was something we could share um, and then we could post on iDevelop so that as we think through across the four authorities what our CLD plans look like and how we engage with communities. There's another example there that we could start to think through that's something that we can use in Fife and Angus or in, in, in Perth. 